Pokemon Sword and Shield has been one of the strongest lineups of Pokemon we've had in generations. While not every Pokemon was a top tier threat, I want to go over a highlight of some of the strongest Pokemon from Sword and Shield. I do have to preface though, this is not meant to be a top 10 list. I'm just discussing some Pokemon I felt had a strong impact on these games, whether that list ends up being 10 Pokemon. Regardless though, as always, if you enjoyed the content, make sure you leave a like on today's video. And make sure to use that subscribe button to stay up to date on all future videos. Before we begin though, I'm going to be starting a brand new series on Mystic Umbreon shorts for Pokemon Scarlet and Violet pretty soon. It's going to be specifically over there. And if you guys like in-game playthroughs, I think it'll be right up your alley. We also upload daily Pokemon facts over there. Oh, and Mystic Reads. I wonder what Naruto and the gang are up to. Links for both these channels will be in the description and at card above. Since we're discussing the strongest Pokemon in Sword and Shield, we should first take a look at what Gigantamax Pokemon were the most impactful in this metagame. Among the 33 Gigantamax Pokemon, I would say there were three that truly defined this generation. The first one being Gigantamax Colossal. Any players who played VGC knows Gigantamax Colossal, while never the number one Pokemon in the format, was always a Pokemon that players needed to respect. Colossal was one of the easiest G-Max Pokemon to sweep an opponent's entire team with, thanks to its ability, Steam Engine. Steam Engine boosts Colossal's speed by plus six, whether you're attacked with a water or fire type move. Typically, teams would attack Colossal with a weak water type attack, such as Surf on Sneasel, in order to pop a weakness policy with this ability to sweep teams. Finally, the signature move, Max Vocalith, proved to make Colossal a monster, allowing 1-6 damage over time to anything that was not a rock type for 4 turns, making Colossal a massive threat this generation as the anti-meta G-Max Pokemon. While our next terrifying Gigantamax Pokemon was known for being a threat in and out of G-Max, it was only elevated in threat level due to having a G-Max option. One of the next threats in Sword and Shield is none other than Venusaur, one of the most destructive pieces to any strong Sun team in Sword and Shield. Venusaur actually benefits significantly this generation due to the way speed change to automatically recalculate speed tiers anytime something happens in a given turn. For example, if I swap in Torkoal at the start of the turn, my Venusaur no longer needs to wait until the following turn to gain the 2 times speed boost. In tandem with how strong both Torkoal and Groudon were in VGC this generation, Venusaur became one of the strongest G-Max Pokemon. Venusaur also had a few other benefits this generation, such as a strong matchup against Groudon and Kyogre, which proved to be two of the stronger restricted options in VGC. Also, the signature move G-Max Vine Lash allowed Venusaur a move similar to what made Colossal so over the top, dealing 1-6 damage to any Pokemon that wasn't a grass type for 4 turns. Venusaur provided Sun with a powerful offensive threat, both with and without its G-Max form. Finally, we do have one more G-Max Pokemon that in my eyes defines Sword and Shield's new mechanic, being Gigantamax Charizard. Gigantamax Charizard in my eyes truly ended up defining how this mechanic can truly be insane to deal with for a few reasons. Charizard's signature G-Max move, G-Max Wildfire, functions similar to Venusaur and Colossal's, with the added benefit of also being a Fire-type G-Max move. This means that Charizard has a strong option to boost this with a Sunsetter such as Torkoal, Groudon, or in some formats, even Whimsicott was a viable option. Charizard would pair these with its ability Solar Power, as well as items such as a Weakness Policy or a Life Orb to deal immense damage to most teams in tandem with a Sun Boost for G-Max Wildfire. You could also utilize Max Airstream to boost your speed, as well as the speed of your ally Pokemon, which allowed Sun Teams a strong G-Max that could help enable any Pokemon on your team to sweep. Charizard was overall, in my eyes, easily the most influential G-Max option for all of Sword and Shield. One of the surprise rises this gen came as a side effect for VGC of how common Dynamax was, in the rise of Thunderous. While Thunderous typically is a viable Pokemon in VGC due to its support with Prankster, alongside moves such as Thunder Wave and Scary Face, Thunderous saw its time to shine as a metagame staple for a few new reasons this generation. One of these being the rise of Defiant Thunderous, which was previously illegal in Generation 6 and 7 due to the lack of a method to obtain Defiant Thunderous. For VGC, you couldn't transfer a Generation 5 Thunderous of Defiant. 
So this is the first generation since Gen 5 this has been legal. While Prankster is still certainly useful, with moves such as Eerie Impulse, Scary Face, Taunt, Nasty Plot, and Thunder Wave being stellar options to utilize the ability, Defiant is able to help Thunderous pull off some absolutely terrifying movesets this gen, thanks to the Dynamax mechanic. Dynamax has a plethora of moves such as Max Strike and Max Darkness, which lower a specific stat for both your opponent's Pokemon. But Defiant will give Thunderous plus two attack any time it loses any of its stats. So while Thunderous may drop its speed by one stage when hit with Max Strike, you'll gain two stages in attack to make up for it. This also works with abilities. And with the ridiculous usage this generation for Landorus T and Incineroar, Thunderous can typically boost its physical attack very rapidly in order to maximize this benefit, while also utilizing moves such as Max Airstream thanks to Fly and Max Knuckle of Superpower. Thunderous becomes a stat-boosting machine with Dynamax, as well as one of the most terrifying Dynamax users. Speaking of Generation 5 Pokémon. Whimsicott had another standout season this generation as one of the most terrifying support Pokemon. Similar to Venusaur, Whimsicott stood out as a terrifying support option due to the newly modified speed mechanic, allowing it to make a name as the main Tailwind user of this gen. Whimsicott also had a couple of other key options to benefit VGC teams though, as it was not only the fastest prankster option, but it also came with the move Taunt, which allowed it to typically defeat other prankster options. This allowed Whimsicott to carve out a niche as one of the best speed control options for prankster Pokemon, while using other support options such as Memento, Helping Hand, Sunny Day, Charm, Cotton Spore, and so many more niche status moves depending on the matchup. Whimsicott, while simple, has been truly one of the biggest enablers of this generation. One of the most prolific support Pokemon this generation came from the newly introduced Pokemon, being Grimmsnarl. If Grimmsnarl was the biggest enabler due to its speed control, then Grimmsnarl was one of the biggest for bulky offense teams with screens. Grimmsnarl stole the show this generation as easily being one of the best screen setters due to its ability Prankster, as well as dual screens with Light Screen and Reflect. While slower than Whimsicott by a considerable margin, Grimmsnarl never has to worry about Taunt due to its dark typing, which provided a strong advantage over the Cotton Swab. Grimmsnarl typically utilize moves such as Thunder Wave and Scary Face in order to still give teams that opted for a more defensive form of support some speed control, which was very essential in order to enable Pokemon such as Groudon and Landorus a route to decimate teams. If you needed to use Grimmsnarl offensively, however, you were typically in luck thanks to its strong priority options with Sucker Punch, which was able to pick off frailer offensive threats. Speaking of dark types, one of the most terrifying Pokemon for doubles was easily Incineroar. Incineroar redefined what was truly viable in doubles this gen thanks to its typing, as well as the ability Intimidate. Incineroar was basically created in a lab to produce the ultimate doubles Pokemon, with access to moves such as Fake Out, Taunt, and Parting Shot for strong support, while also utilizing a wide variety of offensive options such as Throat Chop, Flare Blitz, and Darkest Lariat in order to apply offensive pressure in matchups as well. Incineroar consistently reached well into the 60-70% usage rates this gen for doubles, and while its singles performance left a lot to be desired, not even Pokemon such as Zossie and Crown were able to pass its splash ability on teams. Next, let's discuss a few Pokemon that had some stellar performance in both VGC and singles, with the first one being Rillaboom. Rillaboom had a strong performance in both formats due to two specific reasons. Being Grassy Surge, which allowed the grass type moves to receive a 1.3 times boost, but also the move Grassy Glide, which was new to Generation 8. Grassy Surge Rillaboom was considered to be a staple for teams in VGC, as it provided them a strong response to teams without needing to rely on Trick Room or Tailwind to speed control while also being able to weaken Landorus T's Earthquake, and even adding another strong pivot for players. While you could argue that Rillaboom had a strong presence for teams of Gigantamax as well, in my opinion, it lacks the ability to touch our top three in notoriety, as teams with Rillaboom would usually Dynamax other Pokemon. Rillaboom in later VGC formats provided teams with a strong offensive option for both Kyogre and Groudon, while also a respectable priority option to pick off Calyrex Shadow Rider. 
Meanwhile in singles, Rillaboom was typically opting to run either Choice Band or Swords Dance movesets with great success. While its viability has been inconsistent this generation in OU, it's typically remained at least in noteworthy enough Pokemon to require teams to pack a response. Discussing any list going over competitive threats this generation requires that we mention both Urshifus, which truly did shake up both VGC and doubles. Urshifu Rapid provided VGC with one of the most destructive offensive fighting types. With such a strong presence in its base form, it actually significantly outclassed the Gigantamax Pokemon due to most teams preferring the Dynamax other Pokemon, as Urshifu's signature move Surging Strikes was just that strong. Urshifu Rapid provided teams a strong response to Pokemon such as Incineroar and Landorus Therian, while also allowing teams a strong way to defeat Focus Sash users that ran rampant in the tier. Urshifu Rapid also gained a boost to its water attacks under Rain, leaving it to be one of the more terrifying offensive options in the tier. While Urshifu's single strike was typically outclassed in VGC, in singles it was actually better by a strong margin. Urshifu's single was actually so much stronger, it actually received a ban in singles due to how difficult it was to switch around between its signature move Wicked Blow, as well as strong options such as Sucker Punch and Close Combat. One of the strongest Pokemon in any generation it graces, Lender Asterion yet again managed to sneak its way in the Sword and Shield. If you ask any OU player what Pokemon holds the tier together, most will tell you Landorus is truly one of the most defining Pokemon for what the OU tier needs to thrive. Landorus is able to basically be a glue Pokemon to any team regardless of playstyle thanks to the ability Intimidate, its strong move pull, and a powerful offensive typing. Landorus typically opted for either Choice Scarf, Swords Dance, or Defensive sets this generation in singles and most teams in OU actually found it pretty difficult to justify benching Landorus unless you were running a hard stall team. Landorus managed to even find itself being one of the more viable options in Ubers, as a strong check to Pokemon such as Groudon, Zekrom, and Zamazenta crowned, despite not actually being banned to Ubers. As for VGC, Landorus was still one of the stronger options here as well but typically, you were only using Landorus Therian offensively. Landorus typically ran Earthquake and Rock Slide, then 2F Protect, Fly, Swords Dance, Knock Off, or U-Turn. Assault Vests would typically choose U-Turn and Knock Off, meanwhile sets that ran either White Herb or Life Orb typically chose Fly and Protect or Swords Dance. Overall, Landorus Therian yet again proved to dominate another generation of competitive Pokemon for every format it graced. Our last Pokemon that was strong in both singles and doubles comes from another new Pokemon to the Gala region, being Dragapult. While Dragapult's doubles viability practically only existed in formats that lacked restricted Pokemon, Dragapult still provided teams with a strong offensive option in VGC formats such as Series 9. Whether you ran items such as Weakness Policy, Safety Goggles, Life Orb, or Lumberry, Dragapult typically would utilize a physically offensive set with moves such as Dragon Dance, Phantom Force, and then some other form of either Breaking Swipe or Dragon Darts depending on the player's preference. Clear Body typically was the ability of choice here, as it allowed Dragapult to avoid the fear of Landorus T and Incineroar when you tried to sweep teams while Dynamaxed. While in doubles Dragapult typically ran physical sets, Dragapult would opt to run special sets in singles. Whether you ran choice specs or heavy duty boots, Dragapult would typically opt to run a move set of Hex, U-Turn, Draco Meteor or Dragon Pulse, and a fourth move. On specs variants, you typically see Flamethrower or a second Dragon move. Meanwhile, heavy duty boots variants ran Will-O-Wisp in order to help boost Hex's damage output without the use of another teammate. Occasionally though, Dragon Dance sets were still useful, though these were typically saved for the Ubers tier or Battle Stadium singles. Overall, Dragapult was one of the strongest newly added offensive Pokemon from Sword and Shield. Moving on to our singles only staples, we have one of our other extremely versatile options being Heatran. While most people typically establish Landorus T as the clear cut most used Pokemon in OU, Heatran actually does a strong job of establishing itself in the top 5. Heatran was in my eyes though, the clear second best in the tier for most of the generation, becoming basically the still type version of Landorus T. Heatran, similarly to Landorus, could provide teams a fairly versatile option when team building that fit on a wide variety of playstyles. Heatran would typically run either a Stallbreaker moveset with Taunt plus Magma Storm, 
a choice spec set with eruption, flash cannon, earth power, flamethrower, or in some cases, even air balloon, specifically with the intention of walling other Heatran that lacked flash cannon. Heatran basically mirrored the Landorus effect this generation, of needing to always make sure it can take itself out due to how powerful and influential Heatran was this gen. Another metagame staple this generation was none other than Weavile, which was an overnight success for the Sword and Shield OU tier. Upon the production of the Crown Tundra, Weavile gained access to the move Triple Axel, which provided it a terrifying offensive option that would soon redefine just how powerful this monster could be. Weavile was typically seen destroying the OU tier, with either choice span sets consisting of Triple Axel, Knockoff, Ice Shard, and Low Kick, or you'd swap choice span to a Heavy Duty Boots, and chance out Low Kick for Swords Dance in order to sweep teams. Weavile is by far one of the strongest options for an offensive breaker, with some of the only options to pressure it being Pokemon such as Toxapex and Buzzwall, both of which can be beaten by common Weavile partners such as Zapdos. Overall, Weavile was an absolute terror of this gen in OU, but there's one more option that somehow broke the tier even more than Weavile did. Finally, we move on to one of the most potent wall breakers in all of OU, Melmetal. Melmetal was able to take advantage of the OU tier as a strong offensive option thanks to its ability Iron Fist, which boosted attacks such as Ice Punch, Thunder Punch, and even its signature move Double Iron Bash was a new move this generation, allowing Melmetal 260 base power attacks that were Stab and Iron Fist boosted, which allowed Melmetal to essentially massacre any Pokemon neutral to steal. Most Pokemon that resisted this either cave to one of the elemental punches or earthquake though, which meant that switching against Mel Metal was a nightmare. Teams opted to either utilize a choice span for maximum damage, or sometimes protective pads, as Pokemon such as Mel Metal, Urshifu Rapid, and Weavile the name of few caused a surge in rocky helmet usage among defensive Pokemon. As with most of our top tier Pokemon though, Mel Metal also had more defensive options such as Toxic plus Protect or Assault Vest in order to surprise teams that assumed you were offensive. Mel Metal got so bad that it actually recently was suspect tested. However, this ended in a landslide vote for no ban, leaving it as one of the strongest OU mons left in Sword and Shield. Sword and Shield provided us with a vast range of viable Pokemon for both singles and VGC. While I covered a few I thought were noteworthy, I'm aware I probably missed one of your favorites that let that mark this gen in competitive. If I missed a Pokemon you felt was influential to Sword and Shield's metagame, make sure to comment down below which Pokemon you felt was the strongest this generation. Also, if you enjoyed the video, make sure to leave a like and use that subscribe button to never miss an upload. Hey, it's the outro. Isn't that exciting? Thank you for enjoying another Mystic Umbreon video. We're getting ready to enter the fall, and the final stretch of hype for Scarlet and Violet is here. The excitement for Pokemon's ninth generation is at its peak, and I couldn't be more excited. We've still got plenty to cover before then though, so keep yourselves locked in. If you're interested in more Mystic content, check out my TikTok and Mystic Umbreon Shorts channel. If we get the 10K followers on TikTok, and we're super close, I'll be doing a viewer's choice video. Also, if you're into fan fictions and what ifs, check out Mystic Reads. I offer a ton of creative spoken word content on there, so come and join me. That's all for now. Make sure you subscribe for more fantastic content, and I'll see you next time.